Getting back to your personal faith journey, Michael, and the different breakthroughs you've had, love to hear more about that. That'd be wonderful. I would certainly have to say uh, most of our faith begins from somebody else, uh, often a parent. Uh, no boy had a better mother than I did. Now, my mother had her own faith challenge when she was growing up. And, but once she found God, God just gave her the gift of faith, and my mother never questioned anything. Right. Um, I, you need to see God sometimes through somebody else's, the lens of somebody else's soul. I, I, I get that idea from Mary and Jesus. And when Mary says, my favorite thing she says, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And I think Jesus saw his father. Um, I can't prove this. It's, it's a belief. I think Jesus first saw his father in heaven through the lens of his mother's soul. Yeah. And she magnified it. You know, it, to magnify means to fill the vision. Okay. And you fill the vision whether it's binoculars or microscope or telescope, you're filling the vision with something. And my mother's soul magnified my father in heaven. She just put him right here. And she did it in unique ways. I think you've heard me talk about, I loved lizards. I still love lizards. <laughs> okay. Uh, any kind of lizard is a good idea. Uh, snakes, little frogs, and I'd go out in the fields when I was growing up as a boy, and I'd catch them, and I'd bring them home to my mother. And my mother would never say, oh, you know, get that out of the house. <laughs> she, I got this little wiggling garter snake here, right, or a horny toad. Horny toads were my favorite. I tell the story all the time. And my mother would get down, and she would say, which of Heavenly Father's little creatures did you bring home today, son? And so from five and six years of age, I believed God made lizards for me to catch. <laughs> and I loved lizards, and I loved the God who made them for me. To this day, I still would b believe God made lizards and garter snakes for little boys to catch. You know, what other possible purpose right. can they have? I agree. Know, that, yeah. So I had this wonderful mother who, who showed me, and then she took us to the national parks, and I learned to see God in his majesty mm -hmm. and his wonder where I could look and say it is beautiful and glorious, you know, from, from the tiny little lizard to the, Half Dome in Yosemite and Bryce Canyon. That I, I came to really, really love him. And I knew that my mother not only believed in God, but she loved him. And we'll come to that at the end, you know, maybe at the end. She, it's not a matter of just believing. You have to come to love him. And when I was 12, I had a blessing and a lot of inspired things in it, but uh, the last sentence of the blessing, the patriarch, I, you know, probably, I don't know how much you knew about my mother or me, you know, but he said, I bless you with the power to walk the straight and narrow path, seeking, I get emotional, yeah, seeking to fulfill the prayer that shall always be in the heart of thy mother. How could I ever walk away? How could I ever? I, with that gift, because I knew the prayer that was in the heart of my mother, she passed away. It's still in her heart, you know, prayer for her children and then her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. So it is wonderful to see God through somebody's, the lens of somebody's soul. Uh, we don't always get it. I know others don't have that, mm -hmm. and maybe you have to find it. But you may be, it's another reason to engage in a, a religion. 
It may be your soul, the lens of your soul, that somebody first yes. sees God yes. through. Um, I just saw it through my mother. The second big foundation of my own faith journey is you have to talk to God. You, 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 you've got to talk to him. Uh, as hard as it may be, it may, you, you talk. I have been talking to God since I was a little boy. Openly, honestly. Right. Um, there's a certain kind of prayer I call it the pour out prayer. Mm -hmm. You just see what's in your soul and you just pour it out. You just tell him, God is, my Father in heaven is the one constant in my life. You know, all the other deep relationships, or many of them are, they're passing in a mortal sense. They're eternal mm -hmm. in a broader mm -hmm. sense, but my wife is gone. Mm -hmm. I can't talk to her anymore. I can, but, you know, my mother's gone. Mm -hmm. God is never gone. And since as long as I can remember, I was talking to him. And that may be because my parents were divorced. I did not have a father. And yet I had the best father anybody ever had. I, and I talked to him constantly, always. So you, you speak to the father. You open up. Pa Pascal, a, a great French philosopher, uh, he said, God gave prayer to man so that man would have the dignity of a casual relationship with deity. So you, you, you commune, you talk. Yeah. And for me, I mean, well, that's, a, again, a whole other topic. How do you get answers and, and commune? You know, but for me, usually it's most important that I talk to him. A lot of times we think the most important thing is that I get all kinds of answers. We want answers to prayer. We're still going to get them. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times in my life, the answer is that I've told him. Yeah. My mother used to say, when challenges came in our life, she would say, we'll put it in the Lord's hands and everything will be all right. And everything always was all right, <laughs> however it turned out. You know, see. So those, hopefully, you're blessed in your life to have someone to see him through. And if not, maybe you're going to be the lens that somebody will see him through. Jesus always says he's father, he's father, he's father, and he's the best father. I want to uh, reiterate again, um, what you said about um, sometimes the answer to our prayer, the, the substance of our needs has to do with not what he's revealing to us, but the fact that we are confident in revealing to him what, uh, what's in our soul. One of right. the greatest phrases I ever heard on this, uh, for lack of better words, testimony, was I was in a my boy went through a very difficult situation, you know about mm -hmm. it, and uh, actually died for 90 seconds right. uh, when he went to the hospital with this situation. And for uh, quite a while, we went to 12-step meetings together. Now, he went initially fundamentally as an atheist. <laughs> but as the months rolled on and as different events in his life unfolded, at one of those meetings, you know, you go around in the circle, if you've ever been to one of those meetings, but everybody shares. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, um, I've started to talk to God a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And he says, I, I don't, and I'm paraphrasing it because I can't remember exactly what he said, but I remember how much it moved me. He said, I, I can't say much about it, but I can say this, before talking to God wasn't nearly as good as my life is now, talking to God. Yeah. Don't say your prayers. Open up the heart. Before you begin that, maybe I can hear the Lord say, Mike, what's in your heart today? Right. Well, I'm 
feeling a little guilty, Father. Well, yeah. tell me. I'm sad. Well, tell me. Um, I'm full of joy. Oh, tell me. And you just look at what's in your heart. And sometimes you don't have to, you know, there's a prayer St. Teresa of Avila talks about called the prayer of quiet. You start with what she called the prayer of recollection. You are remembering what you are grateful for. You're remembering your needs. You're remembering, you know, your. But sometimes you get to the point where you you feel God close enough, and and you just you don't need to say anything. The prayer of quiet. That's been a very important thing that I. And occasionally I say, well, I'm a little bit mad at you, God, today. <laughs> okay. Well, tell me. Well, let's talk about it. And so his dignity can handle my misunderstandings of things and, and my frustrations with life. And so I, I, think, I think you talk. Now, a, another thing for you that I've learned in my faith journey is that often darkness comes before light. And the best, I guess, example, certainly for a Latter-day Saint, is Joseph Smith, the first vision. He's going to have this glorious manifestation of light, this great epiphany that will mark the rest of his life. But there is darkness that comes first. And he has to wrestle with the darkness. And he wrestles with the darkness to the point of despair, to the point of, I was ready to abandon myself. You know, he, he's going to give it up. Uh, maybe not everybody's that way, but most of the deep things of my faith, my testimony, I had to really wrestle with. So if there is a pouring out prayer where you take whatever's in your heart, you empty it to God. There's also a wrestling. Uh, when I was 14, I decided since my mother had such a strong testimony of the Book of Mormon, I needed one. And I was out at the ranch, and I started reading it, and I was just filled with darkness. I don't know how to describe that experience. Doubt, fear, darkness. I kept hearing these voices in my head saying, it isn't true, it isn't true, it's, it's all made up. It's, and, and I can remember little things that bothered me, names like anti-Nephi-Lehi's. You know, and I'm thinking, Joseph Smith made that up, you know, and... And, and I'm not expecting this. I want the warm, positive, peaceful, joyful things that my mother has told me about. And I'm not getting it at all. I remember one day reading, it was a Sunday. We didn't work on Sunday at the ranch. We, we had church as a family because it was way out in the middle of nowhere. And I went down in the willows by the river and I poured out my fear and doubt and begged God to tell me this thing was true and good and, and that I could believe my mother and nothing, nothing. The heavens are brass. And that wrestle will go on for about five years. Now, why did God do that? I don't know. Finally, when the answer finally comes, I'm ready to go on a mission. And, and when it came, it came powerfully, uh, unforgettably. Mm -hmm. But it took me from 14 to 19 to get there. Maybe he just wanted me to persevere. I don't know what God was trying to teach me. Maybe so I could relate to people who wrestle or struggle. Um, we want answers really quickly. Uh, you know, my first temple experience was, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm thinking this can't be my church. <laughs> you know, now, uh, if you were to ask me now, what are some of the most rock solid foundational faith? I would say, personally, so certainly Jesus. You know. Um, my Father in heaven, you know, my, my faith begins with, with him. Right. Uh, Jesus comes later. Um, 
but it would be Book of Mormon and Temple. You know, they're just, it's, but they didn't start out that way. Yeah. So that's one principle that I've learned. So when darkness comes, I don't panic. Okay. I don't get too worried. I just try and pers Joseph Smith said he continued to call upon God. Jesus in Gethsemane uh, in a dark hour, his, now his isn't doubt hour, but, but Luke says, being in an agony, he yeah. prayed more earnestly. So maybe the only way I know how to pray more earnestly is for God to make me pray a little longer to know how, how badly do you want this? The thing I learned in life is the road widens and narrows of faith. Faith is like that mountain that Shasta is walking over mm -hmm. in the mountains. It's, and sometimes the path is very broad and I'm not going to fall off, you know, I... I've hiked Angel's Landing in Zion's, and, and I like to hike. I like to climb <laughs> mountains. And, and sometimes the path gets very narrow, and you better be careful because you could fall off. And sometimes it's very wide, and you can run. You don't have to even look too carefully where you're going. And my life of faith has sometimes been that way, and I take great comfort in a verse from Habakkuk, of all prophets. When do we ever quote Habakkuk? Okay. Habakkuk begins with his question about how God is running the world. You know, why, why is evil always getting away with anything? We aren't fish, he says, where the big fish eats the little fish. You're, you didn't make men like fish, did you? Then why are the big men eating the little men down here? Okay, I don't, remember that okay. I don't yeah, he's yeah. he's really questioning God, yeah. and God basically says to him as an answer, "Look, Habakkuk, the just have to live by faith." So he has two words: just faith. Number one, I expect you to live a just life, and you're just going to have to live by faith sometimes. And then, and Habakkuk gets through it, and he ends with this wonderful image of. Hind's feet on high places. I remember that. And yeah. I've seen in Israel, I've seen a lot of places where ibex and mountain goats, uh, animals that live high up on little ledges on the cliffs. And you, you, you can watch National Geographic. You know, the, they're, you know, half an inch wide they were walking on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in our life, things might happen when the path of faith seems to be like a tiny ledge, and I'm afraid I'm going to fall off. And we're going to need Heinz feet. And we're going to need Heinz feet. Right. And so you just, you just hold on. Mm -hmm. That's it. You just hold on and pray for Heinz feet. Mm -hmm because it isn't going to stay that way. You know, Laurie died and my path, all of a sudden, I'm not mad at God. Mm -hmm. Life happens, no yeah. sense, life happens. But all at once, all my happiness hinged on my belief system, on temple ordinances and, and promises and covenants. Uh, yeah, the, the the structure of faith. It, it yeah. all it all hinged on that. What I'd always believed in, and I'd had my dark moments, but mm -hmm. now I'm having another dark moment. Okay, I'm my path is narrow again, and I just have to hold on. You you just hold on, and the path widens. So. Darkness before life, wide and narrow. There's a, there's a beautiful parable in uh, section 88 mm -hmm. about the laborers in the vineyard. And the Savior has 12 laborers in the vineyards. Go out and labor in the vineyard. In the first hour, I'm going to come and visit you and work with you. And you'll enjoy my countenance. It's, it's a beautiful parable. I love it. It's... It's right up there with prodigal son and good Samaritan, mm -hmm. the, the labors in the vineyard in, in 88. And then I will, I will go to the second and spend an hour with him, and then the third, and then the fourth, all the way down to the 12. I'm going to visit each one of you. There's a lot of comfort for me in knowing that 
we all get our time and our hour and our season when he is he is just there yeah but sometimes in our life we feel like he's withdrawn and occasionally we we think oh what have i done wrong how come i don't feel the spirit quite the same anymore now there may be something you did do wrong and you need to examine your yeah. life and see yeah. if there's something that is right doing it but there is a natural pattern the savior it, he uses the word I withdrew. He withdrew from the first to visit the second to the third. But, he says, but I'll be back, beginning at the first to the last, and the last to the first, and the first to the last. I visit, i close to you, but understand, there'll be times when I withdraw. Um, what, and what would you say his purpose is in allowing the relationship between us and him to include moments where he's a little more withdrawn oh i suppose he has his reasons i would if i apply you know that happens in moses mm -hmm. moses uh, he withdraws and lucifer comes you know? mm -hmm. uh, maybe it is to create a hunger yeah, yeah. um i yeah. didn't know how much i loved and needed Laurie until she withdrew. You know, now I know how much I love and need her. And sometimes those more sterile moments in our lives, those withdrawing moments, maybe is to create. Maybe, you know, he, he wants us to think. When he withdraws from Moses, Moses thinks, you know, he ponders, he's he reflects. Um, yeah. uh, maybe it's to give us strength. Maybe we need to rely on our own wisdom a little bit more. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like a parent saying to the child, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to run by the bicycle with you now. You, see, you, know, you may crash out there in the street. but I'm, there, there's, a, there's an ebb yeah. and flow of his presence for, for, I think, ultimately, for our own refinement, yeah, probably. I, I think so. So I just, yeah. I just learned that there's dark and light sometimes mm -hmm. and there's wide and narrow and uh, he withdraws and he comes back we all get our time and our hour and i don't yeah. let it trouble my faith uh, like i would have when i was maybe younger or uh, you know when i when I, I hear other people going through that i i try to yeah. help them understand the pattern there's a you know another thing that I, I just jotted down is faith is a living thing. I needed to learn it's a it's, it's alive. It's it's growing. It's it, it's a tree. You know the the tree of life. If you asked Alma, yeah. where does the tree of life grow? The answer would be in the human soul. Okay, so m the tree is growing of the tree of my faith and my belief of of my engagement with God, um, it's growing. And I have to re realize it's a living thing. And you have to pay attention to living things. You have to water it, and you have to feed it and nurture it. And, and the, if it's a tree, you're going to tri trim it. You saw my beautiful tree in the front yard? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's my tree of life. Right. Every spring, those beautiful pink flowers, it's gorgeous. But I have to trim that every few years. I have to trim it down and, and keep it shaped so yeah. that, that it, those blossoms come out. This is the third year. Every, you know, and, and so it's gorgeous now. Mm -hmm. I'll have to trim it again. And, and So anyway, Alma talks about the tree, but it's, it's alive. And you have to feed it. And there's lots of ways of feeding and nourishing faith and belief for each other that's one of the reasons we engage in religion so somebody can help me feed my tree and i can help them feed their but tree what would you say michael what would you say is the the benefit or the significance to our souls of feeding our faith and including that initial moment of giving place for certain possibilities that there is a god that he does love me and that I want to feed that. I want, like you, you talked about your tree, and you want to prune it and shape it and uh, cl clip it and uh, fertilize it. But why? 
Well, in being totally and perfectly honest, knowing what I know about me, I shudder to think what I would be without God. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, when he wrote the screw tape letters, people asked him, how do you know so much about human weakness and evil and temptation? And he said, I, I didn't have to look any deeper than my own soul to know everything about it. So there's, uh, again, being absolutely honest. And I'm not, I've never been a great sinner. Okay. <laughs> I could have been. What stopped me? It's that talking to him all the time, not wanting to disappoint him, feeling when I have disappointed him, his understanding, his love, his forgiveness, his encouragement, um, his pride in my growth, his assurance You'll get there. You, yeah. you know, uh, George MacDonald said, obedience is not perfection. Yeah. Obedience is trying. And you're always trying. I'm trying. God knows I want to be a good person. And I need his constant input in order to be so. So I could say I... I have images of what I might have been had I not had a mother who put him right here, had I not talked to him all the time, had I not had mm -hmm. friends and people positioned through my life that helped me. Doesn't mean it's been easy. I have wrestled for almost every affirmation I would make to you. I found something in Ether that was really, really helpful to me about faith. He says in Ether 4.3, he that believeth these things, things have been taught. So in reference, this is about Christ, about prophets, about God. Okay. Mm -hmm. He that believes these things, which I have spoken, him will I visit with the manifestation of my spirit. Now, when I first read that, I mean, I read it for years and years and never saw anything with it. But this time when I read it, I thought, hey, wait a minute, that's backwards. I'm supposed to have a manifestation, and then I can believe. And he says, no, you believe first, and then I'll manifest it. And him will I visit with the manifestations of my spirit, and he shall know and bear record. And then he adds this beautiful thought, for because of my spirit, he shall know that these things are true, for it persuadeth men to do good. How will I know something is true? It persuades men to do good. And whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do good is of me, for good cometh of none, save it be of me. I am the same that leadeth men to all good. If you get even deeper into, into the heart and soul of Christianity, that I could say, I believe that there is infinite goodness wrought in my soul as I meditate on the atonement of Christ or the fact that through his grace I am brought to God. When I let that in, yeah. there is <clears throat> such goodness that comes as a result of that. And so you can and, do it that same that same word. Yeah. Can any aspect of people's faith. Good, true, and beautiful yes. in Western civilization have always been somewhat interchangeable. And where does Moroni get that? He gets it from his father Mormon, and he quotes, he he includes when he has some few plates left over and he's not dead, he says, Well, I don't want to let a good gold plate go to waste. So I'm gonna give you my father's speech. And that's Moroni 7. And notice the two other verbs we get with good. So I have persuadeth. If something persuades you to do good, to be good, you'll know it's of me. I don't need a revelation from God. 
God is saying, right. you know, sometimes, well, I pray and you give me the answer. Now, mm -hmm. who does that put all the responsibility for me getting an answer on? Right. Puts it on God. And God is saying, look, you read, you study, you think, and you make a decision. Does it persuade you to do good to be good? That's and it. I say, yes. And then he says, well, then what do you know? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Then you know it's of me. Okay. Right. And you use that for everything. 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 Yeah. Okay. So I get two more verbs now from his father. He says, behold, that, this is Moroni 7, that which is of God inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve him is inspired of God. And I skip it down to verse, he says, therefore, it is given unto you to judge. You don't need to have me telling you everything. You judge. Does it persuade you? entice you and invite you. I love those words because mm -hmm. true religion never forces. Yeah. Uh, that's a hard lesson for a lot of religions to learn. Christianity is basically learned that, you know, Islam is having a little bit of trouble in places like Iran and Afghanistan yeah. learning that uh, right. what the Quran itself said, the Quran says there is no compulsion in religion. That's right out of the Quran. But it's hard for religions not to want to use compulsion. True religion invites, persuades, and entices you to goodness. It wasn't always, well, is it true? Is it true? True is so scientific, one word, black, white, but good. Good is a little easier for people to, to make a judgment on something. So if I read the Book of Mormon, and, I, and, I, and he says, Did, does that invite and entice and persuade you to do good? And I say, oh, it certainly does. He says, well, then what do you know? Okay. Yeah, I listen to the general conference, uh, or I can say, I, I, I read the story of the Buddha's life, or I, I hear uh, George MacDonald, the congregational minister, and I'm always asking that question. I can hear the Lord asking, does it invite and entice and persuade you to do good and to be good and to love God and serve your fellow men? Yes. Well, then what do you know? Right. And all of a sudden, I come to my next principle I learned in my faith journey is that God has many, many voices. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I probably grew up thinking, well, God spoke in the Old Testament with his prophets in the New Testament, and, and then for a Latter-day Saint, and then we have the Book of Mormon, and, and there's the, the Reformers, and, you know, but his, what we would call God's voice is limited. And, and then, we, then, you know, a lot are saying, well, it's a Bible, it's done. Okay, the Quran, it's done, that's it, you know. Um, <clears throat> Emerson gave a great talk in 1838 to the Harvard Divinity School where he said, it's the job of the minister, the preacher, the teacher to teach that God is, not was, that he speaks, not spake. So um, I think I grew up with a limited view, but I'm also being taught God loves all of his children. Right. Uh, so he certainly want to speak to them all. And that was a great thing for me, instead of saying, well, he spoke to apostles and prophets to realize that he has many, many voices. And not everybody can hear the voice of a prophet or an apostle, but they might be able to hear a sage or a philosopher or a poet or a, a musician or an artist or the lives of beautiful people. And so now I say, God has been talking to his children every way he can, everywhere, all the time. And you just have to look and listen, and you're going to hear his voice persuading and inviting and enticing you to do good everywhere. Now, that's still, I still think engage in an institutional religion. You, to, to, to maximize that process. There's right. a, Houston Smith is a comparative religion writer, and 
he says, if one religious tradition claims you, embrace it. You will learn more that way. But listen. And in listening, comprehend. And in comprehending, come to love. He's, he's saying you, you, you embrace yours, but listen because God's voice is like an orchestra. And maybe apostles and prophets are the violin section, but the Lord would say, I have some lovely oboes and French horns and, you know, and, and cellos and, and all of these things I want you to hear because they will all persuade you and entice you to do good and to be, to be good. I think a lot of that too has to do with what we're willing to hear from who and when. Yeah. So it could be a, a member of your family or, or the guy next door or somebody at work is going to say something that opens you up and, sure. and en enlivens your spirit yeah. and inspires you. Like what Joey said in that meeting. And uh, I think another thing Joey said that I just loved, uh, he said, Pops, he said, it's not God, are you there? It's God, I am here. Mm. I just loved it when yeah, he said that. Yeah. So, so is he yeah. any is he any different than say, an apostle from the New Testament or anyone else? God, whatever voice he can use in any given moment that you're willing to listen to, he will use it. Yeah, he will. That's right. I mean, even the uh, Eckhart Tolle, who wrote probably one of my favorite books ever, which is A New Earth. I can feel God just speaking through him, and he's fundamentally an atheist. Yeah. So God, God doesn't care. If he can use somebody like that as his voice, he will. And that, it's so beautiful to me. I, you'll find I love that. truth everywhere, mm -hmm. and you'll find goodness, and you'll find beauty. The danger is, in our lives, is that we say, enough. We say enough, no. and we never want to say to God, enough. Well, I think uh, this has been absolutely uplifting for me, Michael. Thank you so much for... Thank you. As I can't think of anything more I'd rather talk about or who to talk to than, <laughs> than uh, some of the things we've... we've uh, I, I hopefully just... it's helpful for somebody somewhere. Thanks for joining me for part two of my conversation with S. Michael Wilcox. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see you on the next podcast.